Last this conference will now be recorded. <laughs> uh, tonight we are going to talk about sleep stress and social distancing. Um, I do have quite a lot of information to share with everybody um, this evening. So hang in there with me and hopefully I won't overwhelm you too much as we go through um, this presentation. And already I'm having technical difficulties. Um, Aubrey, can you still hear me and see me? Yes. Yep, I can hear you, I can see you. Are oh the slides not? Yeah, they aren't um, progressing. All right, if you, uh, sorry folks. This yeah, is sorry everybody. <laughs> I, I tested <laughs> it out before we started to record, but now they seem to be frozen. That's all right. Um, do you want to send it to me and I can share my screen and you can just tell me when to advance? I'm happy to uh, get you. It's, it's like 60 slides. <laughs> Um, please uh, stop recording. Maybe just start over and let me see what's going on. Sorry. This conference will now be recorded. Welcome, everybody, to our webinar tonight on sleep, stress, and social distancing. Uh, whether you are joining us live or watching a recording, I am very happy to have you here. Uh, during everything that we are experiencing uh, with COVID 19 and social isolation, um, many people are finding that their sleep is severely impacted. Um, and I do have quite a lot of information to share with you this evening. So hang in there with me. I hope to not overwhelm, um, but to really provide you with information um, and ideas of things that you can try if you or your family members are feeling really stressed and not sleeping well at this time. Um, I will be sharing more with you tonight, a little bit about me and my background and my approach to sleep, because I want you to be comfortable with me throughout this presentation. Uh, we will look at some challenges that you or your family members might be currently encountering. Um, we'll be doing a deep dive into understanding sleep through the lifespan. So we will be talking about sleep from infancy all the way through adulthood and what changes and how. Um, we will look at a lot of things that may not initially feel to you very much are. So we will be looking at physical health and mental health, um, choices that we make with behaviors and nutrition and exercise. Uh, for our children and our teens tonight, we'll be looking at how the stage of development impacts their sleep. Um, we'll be looking at schedules and environment. Um, not everything I say tonight may resonate with everybody, and that is 100% okay. Uh, take what feels right to you and leave what doesn't. I won't be offended. <laughs> Uh, so just to share a little bit more about myself with you this evening, um, I do have two master's degrees, one in child development and a second in maternal and child health. Um, I am trained as a pediatric and adolescent sleep consultant, um, additionally trained as a CPR first aid instructor, childbirth educator, um, kind of pulling from a wide variety of education and experience in the information that I will be sharing with you. Um, it is important for you to know that this advice is not medical advice. I am not a medical professional. So if anything I say tonight contradicts what you have heard directly from your healthcare provider, please follow the advice by your healthcare provider. Um, it's also important for me, given that I am doing this through Impact Norwood, um, to disclose that since I am on the school committee and an elected official of the town in Norwood, um, that I have not been and I will not be compensated um, for this presentation that I am giving you this evening. So when a person uh, comes to me, yes? sorry to interrupt. Um, the audio is fading in and out just a little bit. Can you try and just stay closer to the, like the microphone on your computer? I can. Okay. Can you hear me, you we'll hear me better now? now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to do some Googling on my phone to see if there's any other clues as to why that might be happening, but we'll see if this works for now. So sorry to interrupt. Thank no, no, that's okay. Thank you for letting me know. Um, and if it's still a problem, uh, tell me. <laughs> uh, so when a person reaches out to me and says, I'm not sleeping or my child is not sleeping, uh, for me, I think we must consider that the tip of the iceberg. Um, it is never just about sleep. And as you are going to hear tonight, um, it is about many other things that are under the iceberg. Now, even before COVID-19, entered all of our lives and caused us all a lot of stress and changing dynamics. 
Um, sleep was already something that was on the radar of the CDC and the World Health Organization um, as being something that most people across cultures, especially in the United States, um, were not getting enough of. Um, so the World Health Organization has previously declared that sleep deprivation is a public health epidemic. Um, and I feel pretty confident, unfortunately, that our current situation um, is just leading to more sleep uh, deprivation and loss of good quality sleep. Just to share with you a little bit about the experience that I'm bringing to the table and the clients that I typically work with. Um, some of these situations are ones that you or patients or clients of your own have experienced as well. Um, but I do specialize in postpartum depression and anxiety. So I work with many families who have experienced that. Um, I also have extensive training in trauma. Um, and I work with teens and children and their families um, as they have encountered different traumatic experiences, anxiety, depression, sensory processing disorder, special needs. Um, I really strive to help every family figure out, you know, what works best for them. And again, it's gonna be really important as we go throughout this presentation that you figure out in this very unique time we're in, you know, what works best for you and your family. So starting to understand really what is sleep at a biological and hormonal level and why it's so important is something that we just want to quickly cover. Um, I think most of us know, you know, if we don't sleep well, we don't feel well. Um, but it's important to understand that the reason sleep is so important is that because when we are awake, everything in our bodies, everything in our brain, all of our systems is really breaking down. And the only way we repair our muscles, our immune system, our skeletal system, our mental health, our hormonal system, the only way we repair any of that is through sleep. Um, sleep really does rebuild our body and our mind. Um, you're gonna hear me talk about a couple of terms, so I wanna make sure that you understand what I am referencing. Uh, the first concept we need to know is around the circadian rhythm. So the circadian rhythm is the biological clock uh, in the human body. And you can see on the graph that I have on this slide, um, it really does regulate and is influenced by a number of factors. Um, now the circadian rhythm that is illustrated on the slide before you is the average adult circadian rhythm. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more shortly about how there are different chronotypes and not everybody sleeps the same or has the same level of sleep needs, but science has shown that 80% of adults actually fall in alignment um, with the image that you see in front of you, uh, where melatonin, a hormone that helps us fall asleep, starts to secrete around 9, 10 o'clock at night um, for most adults, and you start to get tired at that time. Um, it's really important to keep in mind that our circadian, circadian rhythm does best if kept regular. And right now, my guess is for most people, uh, your sleep schedule is anything but regular. Uh, a lot of people that I'm talking to are having really hard times falling asleep, having a hard time staying asleep. They're waking up, uh, you know, sometimes really early, sometimes sleeping in. A lot of us are taking naps in the middle of the day because we're so exhausted. Um, and we're just finding that we're getting into a very irregular sleep pattern. And unfortunately, not all sleep is equal. Um, just like with nutrition and food, uh, there is junk food and healthy food. Uh, with sleep, there is junk sleep and healthy sleep. Um, so one of the things I want you to think about already is your own or your child's sleep schedule and ask yourself, is your bedtime and is your wait time currently consistent within a 30 minute range day to day? So for example, do you wake up every morning between 7 and 7.30? If you can answer yes, then biologically you're doing some really great things for your body. Um, if the answer is no, uh, no judgment whatsoever, but this is something that you'll want to start to think about. How can you regulate your circadian rhythm? Um, the other concept to know in terms of sleep biology is that there is a secondary sleep drive in the human body called sleep homeostasis, uh, which also has the nickname of sleep pressure. 
And I am going to refer to it this evening as sleep pressure because it's a lot easier to say that over and over again um, than sleep homeostasis. So basically, when you are awake, your body starts to build what is called sleep pressure. And sleep pressure eventually leads to the sensation of feeling tired. Now, part of the reason you want to keep the circadian rhythm really regular is so that you are also regularly building sleep pressure. Um, if you are not getting enough deep quality restorative sleep at night, you are going to have less of an ability to tolerate sleep pressure during the day. And one of the ways that you'll know if you're not getting the sleep that you need at night is if you experience something that is called microsleep. And most of us have been here. So again, no judgment. Um, but if you're trying to pay attention, maybe even right now during this webinar, and you find yourself kind of nodding off, so your eyes start to close, your head feels heavy, your head's falling down to your chin, all of a sudden you're like, who oh, saw me? <laughs> Did I drool? Did I snore? Does anybody know that I just had that very small period of sleep? Um, that is called microsleep. And when we have episodes of microsleep, it means that we're not sleeping well enough at night rhythm has less of an ability to tolerate sleep pressure and we start to feel sleepy during the day. Um, now, if we are taking naps as adults throughout the day, um, although there are some benefits to naps that we'll get into in a few minutes, um, if you are napping for too long or too late into the day, that is going to negatively impact your sleep pressure after the nap and then make it harder for you to fall asleep at night and then make it harder to get into that consistent and regular uh, circadian rhythm that we are trying to achieve. Um, now, everybody has what is called a basal sleep need. And this is the amount of sleep that you as an individual need on a regular basis to feel your best and to perform your best. And when we don't get the sleep that we need, we do start to accumulate sleep. Now, one of the biggest myths out there around sleep is that people often believe that if I don't sleep well today, tomorrow, during the week, um, I'm going to make it up over the weekend. Uh, you know, don't worry, I'm going to sleep in, I'm going to catch up. And unfortunately, just at a very physiological level, um, we cannot make up lost sleep. Once it's lost, it's lost. And I know this isn't a very positive message to hear. Um, but there are ramifications from lost sleep that we can't make up. But then unfortunately, if we sleep in over the weekend, you throw off that regularity that we're trying so hard to build. And without regularity, um, again, we just have a harder time getting into deeper and more restorative sleep. So how much sleep do you need? Um, as an adult, the National Sleep Foundation recommends that adults get between seven and nine hours of sleep a night. Um, now, there is a range, uh, you know, seven to nine hours. Uh, studies have shown that some adults function optimally and feel really well with just six, and some adults also need 10. Um, but what extensive research has found is that there is a U curve related to sleep. And if we sleep either too much or too little, um, that is where a lot of detriments happen to other areas of our physical and mental health. So with that U curve, anything less than six hours or anything more than 10 is usually a sign that you want to probably work with your uh, healthcare provider or um, but really seek somebody in the healthcare field to help you figure out, you know, what is going on? Why are you getting less than six or more than 10 hours of sleep a night? Uh, so a few minutes ago, I said that, you know, with sleep, um, it's similar to food where there is junk sleep and, and healthy sleep. And another really big myth out there around sleep is that all sleep is equal. It's really not. Um, when we sleep, the quality of our sleep and the duration of the sleep all come together and really help us feel and think our best. And again, you'll know when you're not getting the sleep you'll need. You're going to feel it in your body. You're going to feel it in your mood. Um, but when we get good sleep, uh, we do tend to notice we're more alert. We're able to pay better attention and focus. Um, in young children, language acquisition is very much tied um, to the sleep that they get or don't. 
Um, so cognitively, how are we learning? How are we storing memory? How are we feeling in terms of creativity and productivity? Um, our mood can often be an indicator of if we're getting enough sleep or not. Um, our ability to emotionally regulate. Um, you know, we're going to dive in in a few slides about children and teens. And as parents, you know, we often will say that our kids are pretty crabby or our little ones are having temper tantrums. Um, you know, when they don't get enough sleep. But I think it's also important to recognize that even us as adults, our mood, our impulsivity, our ability to regulate um, is all impacted by our sleep as well. Um, we are going to dive into today the connection between sleep and nutrition and fitness, because there is a very uh, triangular relationship between those three. Um, for anybody who has experienced an injury or any type of chronic illness, um, the amount of sleep that you get is also very much tied to your perception of pain and your experience of being successful or not in pain management. Uh, so hopefully you see the next slide before you uh, that is titled Understanding Sleep Through the Lifespan. And this is a graphic that I pulled from the National Sleep Foundation. Uh, you can go to their website, uh, sleepfoundation.org or sleep.org, their sister sites, uh, for a lot of really great information. But here in front of us, we do have a visual um, that shows how our sleep needs change from the time we're born, uh, you know, through toddlerhood, through school age, through adolescence, and then through the different stages of adulthood. And simplicity, we need less sleep as we get older. Um, but if any of you are currently parents of young children or have been parents of young children, uh, you might laugh at that because you know that even though these numbers in front of you on this slide show, for example, that newborn babies need 14 to 17 hours on average a day, they are definitely not sleeping 14 to 17 hours um, consistently. So although the sleep totals are higher, the younger we are, the consolidation of sleep and where biologically the sleep is designed to be the deepest is very different. And that's what I'm going to take you through over the next number of minutes, really helping you understand um, no matter what age you're, you're looking at for yourself or your family, what are your biological and developmental sleep needs and how can we help you optimize that and meet that. Um, so for everybody of, of any age, thinking about our physical sleep environment is important and making small changes can be very impactful in helping you get that deep restorative sleep. So I want you to think my mantra is cool, dark, and quiet. So cooler is always better than warmer when it comes to the ability to get into deep restorative sleep. Um, studies do vary, but they have indicated that for our infants and youngest children, the ideal sleep temperature is between 65 and 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, anything beyond 72, um, I would recommend definitely having a fan in the room, moving that air around, um, because for our youngest children, if the air is too hot, not only will that impact their quality of sleep, um, there are some health risks to that as well. Hot air during sleep can lead to overheating, SIDS, suffocation. So there is a safety component to this. Um, but what you might be surprised to learn is the recommended sleep temperatures for adolescents and adults. Uh, so if there is any argument in your household about what that temperature should or shouldn't be when you're sleeping at night, um, studies have shown and it is recommended that we sleep in temperatures between 55 and 65 degrees, uh, which is pretty cold. Um, but again, what the cool temperatures do is it allows our body temperature to drop. And if we're overheated, um, from a physiological perspective, we don't get into the deepest, most restorative sleep. Uh, so think about the temperature in your room at night and potentially make some changes if you're having a hard time staying asleep. Uh, dark and light is really critical to think about um, when you're looking at your schedule. And if your schedule is not already consistent and you want to start to reinforce to your circadian rhythm a more consistent uh, bedtime and wake time, 
one of the ways you're gonna achieve this is through dark and light exposure. Uh, so essentially, when it is dark in your sleep environment, that starts to communicate to your brain, to your circadian rhythm, to your hormones, that this is a time I should be sleeping. Um, and when we're exposed to light, that communicates to the brain and our endocrine system that we should be awake. Um, now, it is important to understand that this won't happen right away. Um, you know, if you haven't been going to bed until one o'clock in the morning and tonight you turn the lights up at 10 and you think you're going to fall asleep at 10 just because you're in the dark, um, unfortunately, that probably won't happen. Um, you do have to gradually shift things. Uh, but if you are trying to change your wake up time in the morning or your child's wake up time in the morning, be really consistent with the time that you expose yourself or your child to light is going to, over the course of about five to seven days, start to realign the sleep drives. Um, you can see on the slide in front of you that I do have an image of the spectrum of light. So there is a hormone in our body called melatonin. And melatonin is something that the circadian rhythm releases once every 25 hours. Um, now, note that I said every 25 hours because the circadian rhythm is biologically on a 25 hour clock and our society is not. Our society is on a 24 hour clock. Uh, so already every day, our amazing human bodies and brains have to make an investment to align what they are naturally designed to do and what we are asking them to do uh, in society and based on the clocks that we utilize. Um, but if the melatonin is released and we are in an environment that is very bright, that actually starts to get us into a cycle of insomnia. Um, because that is going to tell your brain and your circadian rhythm that tomorrow you actually shouldn't be ready to sleep at 10 o'clock because you still have the lights on or you're still on your phone or you're still on your computer. Um, so you do want to be very mindful of screen time. Um, cool colored lights, blues, purples, and greens, unfortunately, are very bad for sleep. Um, we only want to expose ourselves to as little light as possible. And if you do need to have a night light on or, or any type of light in the room, you want to choose a warm color, red, orange, or yellow. Uh, so we talked about the cool temperatures. We talked about the light. Um, we also want to think about the sound in the room. Um, I am a proponent of white noise. Uh, the National Sleep Foundation recommended as well for everybody of every age. Um, but it is important if you do decide to use white noise that it is constant and consistent. So unfortunately, no music, no waves flashing, no birds chirping. And the reason I'm recommending you don't use these types of things is because the human brain is very pattern seeking. And when we are sleeping, if the sound in our background is changing, that alone can actually keep your brain in a more alert state and prevent it from going into the deep restorative sleep that you're trying to achieve. So that's the first thing I'd like everybody to think about. Take a look at your physical environment and see if you can make some changes there. Um, the second thing I want you to think about is that overall schedule, wake time and bed time, is that consistent or might you need to work on a more consistent schedule? Um, the human body really is designed to sleep and wants to sleep. It's just unfortunately um, the way we often live our lives or the environments that we put ourselves in uh, can impact that ability. So environment and timing alone can make a big difference. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about sleep during pregnancy. Um, I do work with a lot of families who are pregnant or recently had a baby. Um, as I shared with you before, um, I do specialize in working with families who've had postpartum depression or anxiety. And unfortunately, what we're seeing right now in this COVID-19 situation um, is that women are even more at risk for PPD and PPA um, because in most states, uh, you know, still or until recent, recently, um, you're not able to have visitors, you're not able to go places. Uh, when you're birthing in the hospital, you can't have people in the laboring room. I know a lot of hospitals have not allowed doulas. Some hospitals have not allowed even the partner to be in the room. Um, so just the birth experience um, has drastically and suddenly changed for many people and so has the postpartum experience. 
Um, but even before the situation we're currently in, um, we did know that 78% of women are reporting more disturbed sleep during pregnancy than any other time in their life. And this is due to a wide variety of reasons, changed hormones, physical demands of pregnancy, uh, the emotional complications, anxiety, um, depression, restlessness physically and, and emotionally, um, you know, thinking about giving birth, insomnia, GERD, there's just so many things that are wrapped up into um, pregnancy and birth. Um, but I would just encourage people who um, either are pregnant or support families who are uh, to really think about the pregnancy experience, the labor experience, and what impact that has on the family's health even before a baby enters uh, the picture. Um, also want to talk a little bit about mental health needs of new parents. Uh, so many studies have shown, but it is not widely yet recognized in mainstream media that maternal depression can actually start in pregnancy. It's not just postpartum. We call it postpartum depression, but the better name for it would actually be perinatal uh, mood disorder, which is both um, pregnancy and postpartum is both depression and anxiety. Um, I think it's also really important that as a society, we start to talk more about um, the non-pregnant mother um, or adoptive families and also fathers, because all of these uh, areas of parents can also experience depression and anxiety when they are parents for the first, second, or third time. Right now, <laughs> with so many people being home nonstop with their families, I think we're hearing a lot about you know the family system being really stressed out and really overwhelmed. You know, parents are trying to work from home, remote learning with their kids, parents. Um, the dynamic is just really stressful for many people. Um, but even before this drastic change to our society, um, research was pretty clear that parents in this country are pretty stressed out. Um, and I'm a parent myself, so uh, this research definitely does resonate on a personal as well as professional level. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Gottman Institute. If you're not, please look him up. Dr. Gottman is wonderful, um, the work that he does. But his research has found that even the strongest relationships are strained during the transition to parenthood. And that 69% of new parents experience conflict, disappointment, and hurt feelings um, with their partner. Um, so that is a pretty high number of a population. I think that even before this current situation, uh, we should be paying attention to, but especially now. Um, so if anybody in your life is pregnant or recently uh, had a baby, uh, please check in on them. So now we're gonna move into infancy and then go through childhood, adolescence, and into adults as a whole. Um, but I want us to think a little bit about, you know, this term, this idea, this myth of sleeping through the night for our babies. And I know a couple of people who are here live tonight have infants uh, or grandbabies, and we just had a grandbaby. Uh, so some of you are living through this. Um, so if I ask adults, like, oh, are you, as an adult, sleeping through the night? And what does that mean? How many hours does that mean? Usually when I'm in the room doing this in a face-to-face in -face setting, um, people do tend to tell me, you know, between seven and nine hours, which, as we already learned, is what the National Sleep Foundation has covered. Sometimes I do get five or six from some adults as well. Um, but it's usually a much higher number than we would expect for infants. Sorry, just pausing for a second. I don't know. Um, Aubrey, is there a problem with the internet? Um, I just, I stopped your webcam and restarted it because you were frozen, but you're you're good now. Oh, okay. So you can hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you and we can see you. Okay. <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure if I like lost everything. <laughs> no, you're good. My, if my webcam is the problem and you need to like keep it off, so I, I'm okay with that. It's It's been fine. I think we're good. Okay, just wanted to make sure I'm not over here talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, so sleeping through the night for infants um, means something very, very different than it does for um, adults. 
Um, and in the first four months of life, infant sleep biology is very unique. Um, the circadian rhythm that we've been talking a lot about is not yet really functioning or mature. So all of infant sleep in the first four months is really driven by sleep pressure. And this is why our youngest babies tend to sleep pretty much around the clock. Um, they may not sleep for long periods at a time, um, but they're not awake for long periods either. Um, the best thing you can do if you have a baby in the first four months is actually keep their wake window, so how long your baby is awake, um, to no more than two hours. Um, but for our youngest babies in the first two months, actually no more than 90 minutes. Um, because you don't want them to be overtired and build too much sleep pressure during the day, that can actually backfire. Um, now, anybody who's been a parent or works with parents has probably heard of the dreaded four-month sleep regression. Uh, and although I understand why people refer to it as a regression, um, it is actually not a regression, it's a state of maturation. Uh, what happens at the four-month mark is the circadian rhythm does mature and change and now you're going to have a baby who starts to sleep in a very different way. So it can feel like a regression because it's different. And you finally just got the hang of what your newborn is doing. And now everything has changed. <laughs> um, but around four to six months old is when um, the nap timing, the spacing of the naps and the length of the naps uh, start to matter even more. Um, and this is a pretty complicated topic that unfortunately I, I won't have time to dive into fully tonight, but certainly if there's any questions that someone has, I can address the specific question. Um, but if you do have a young baby or you work with family baby, want more information on this, you can email me. Um, my email is at the bottom of every slide that you're seeing this evening. Um, I have a chart that I've created. Um, that really walks you through the first four years and how naps should be spaced that I would be more than happy to share if anybody would find that helpful. Um, but what I think is really important for people to understand about our infants is that they're supposed to be eating overnight. And I know this is really inconvenient to us as parents, uh, but most babies and especially breastfed babies will keep some night feedings until they are nine to 12 months old. And some families will choose to keep a night feeding even longer, and that's okay. Um, infants are really born with um, some well-developed senses. Uh, sight is not well-developed at birth, um, but touch and smell is. And our babies really thrive on being held and touched. And from a developmental and emotional perspective, um, you cannot spoil a baby. And I just want to make sure people know that. You will never spoil a baby uh, by holding them, loving them, soothing them, um, massaging them. Touch is a very powerful thing to use to soothe and help our babies to go to sleep. Um, now, what is helpful for you to understand through infancy till about age four, four years old, is that our young children, are designed to start their night in their deepest, most restorative sleep. And then as the night goes on, their sleep becomes lighter. And what that means is they're going to wake up more frequently. Uh, so babies and young children are biologically supposed to have wake ups uh, at three, four, five, six o'clock in the morning. And when I say a wake up, I don't mean necessarily wake up and start their day, but wake up essentially need to eat, wake up, need some type of contact or soothing, and then go back to sleep. Um, that is not a sleep problem. Uh, one second. Okay. Um, now, I just said that, you know, our young babies and children up until four are supposed to start their night in deep, deep sleep and end their night in light sleep. But as you see on the slide in front of you, and as we briefly touched upon earlier, this unfortunately is not at all how adults are designed to sleep. So with adults, we're supposed to start and end our night in deep sleep. So one of the cruel strikes of mother nature and one of the hardest aspects of parenting, I think of young children, is the fact that when we are designed to be sleeping and need to sleep and want to sleep, our children are going to wake up. Um, and there's no magic answer for that, unfortunately. It's really just more reframing and understanding what are the developmental 
and uh, biological expectation that you should have for your young children. So I wanna move now beyond infancy into young childhood and through the school age years. Um, where, as we saw a number of slides ago from the National Sleep Foundation, that sleep needs do start to decrease. Um, most young children, uh, so here I'm going to say from about age two to about age nine, so two to nine years old, um, are needing somewhere around 10 hours of sleep a night. Um, your youngest children in the first three years, maybe even our four, five, and six year olds, um, also are still napping. Um, but what is happening from ages two to nine is not only are their sleep needs changing, but they are obviously physically growing, um, that brain is rapidly developing, um, you know, cognitively, emotionally, socially, gross motor wise, fine motor wise, there are so many things on fire and so many things changing. And I share this tonight because oftentimes in our society, when our child has a hard time sleeping or they wake up, we view it as a problem and we view it as something that is wrong with our child and needs to be fixed. Um, when very often, especially if your child has been sleeping well, relatively well and if they go through a period of regression, uh, that is actually a sign that internally in that brain that they cannot see um, something amazing is going on. So I know you're tired, I know you're emotional, I know you want your kids to sleep, but I often ask my clients to try to reframe and recognize that very often sleep regressions are a sign of amazing skills and amazing uh, brain maturation that is happening. Um, you can see on the slide in front of you, um, you have newborn, one month, nine months, two years, and adult. And what this image shows um, is the synapses that is in the newborn brain compared to the adult brain. And you can see that from the newborn stage to the two-year mark, um, there's a lot happening. Many synapses are being formed. Um, but then if you compare the two-year slide to the adult slide, um, you'll notice a few things. Um, one, you will notice that there's actually less synapses in the adult image than the two-year-old. Um, but two, you can notice that some of the synapses that are still there in adulthood are actually more defined and thicker. Um, so basically what happens is the experiences that we have in the first two to three years shape our brain and tell our brain, what should I hold on to? What should I let go? And then there is a pruning process that happens after age two to three um, throughout the rest of our childhood and our adolescence. But again, if you just focus on from newborn to two years and you can see that physical difference that is happening, um, it might help explain again why child sleep is changing so much and sometimes regressing. The infant and child brain is designed to practice new skills um, when in light sleep. And again, unfortunately, remember, this is the last one third of the night. Um, and these skills are motor skills, these are new language skills, you know, our school age kids um, are sometimes walking and talking in their sleep, or they might wake up at, you know, three o'clock in the morning and start to tell you a great idea. And they're like, why are you telling me this at three o'clock in the morning? Um, but it's just how, um, unfortunately, their brains are designed. Uh, so again, there are these regressions. Um, but the word regression is, is personally not one of my favorites. And I like to think of it more as a slingshot. Um, and this is true not only with sleep, but also some other challenging behaviors that might emerge throughout the young childhood and school age years uh, with fighting or hitting, challenging behavior, emotional outbursts. Um, whenever things feel harder, often it's because they're taking a step back. Um, the brain is going through rapid development, but then just like a slingshot, we come back and then we fly forward. So often the back is just prefacing some really great things happening. Um, I think I already made it pretty clear that waking isn't always a sleep problem. Biologically and developmentally, um, wakes are designed to happen in our children. Um, but the key is that they can go back to sleep pretty quickly. So if you are experiencing um, with your child, um, that they wake up and they're awake for more than 15 minutes, um, that can be a sign 
of um, some sleep pressure that the schedule needs to be changed. Um, there may be some nutritional stuff going on that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, but if they wake and they are back to sleep within 15 minutes, it's usually not a good sign. Um, a lot of children I am finding in the last five years um, are experiencing um, some sensory processing needs that um, I didn't notice in my clients before. And there's a lot of different theories out there for why that is. Um, but when I say sensory processing, all of us perceive senses in our body in a different way. And not all of us like the same sensations or need the same stimulation as others. Um, but we are seeing in the child development field um, more kids who are sensory seekers or sensory avoiders. Um, and what that either means is that they really don't like how some things feel or they really need additional movements and senses on their body. And if they're at one of those others, those extremes, um, if the body is not getting the sensory stimulation that it needs, um, that can lead to more wake up overnight. Um, so in the work that I do, I, I often um, you know, refer out to OTs and PTs. And um, you know, if people have further questions on this, I'd be happy to answer or, or hear experiences that any of you might have had in this area. Um, but also looking at our, our young children, um, you know, again, they're designed to practice new motor development and cognitive development and language development um, when they are in late sleep. Um, if you have children younger than three, I put um, on the slide some of my favorite resources that you might be interested in looking into. Um, Touchpoint by Dr. Brazelton is one of my all-time favorite developmental books. Um, I personally think every parent should, should read that one to understand what your young kids are going through. So I have a reframe of society that I would like us to consider. And this doesn't always feel comfortable to everybody. So as I said earlier, take what works for you and, and leave what doesn't. Um, but what if stop crying turned into I'm listening for an entire generation? Because just like with sleep, there's so many myths and misconceptions of what our young children should or should not be doing in terms of sleep needs. Um, I do find that there's a lot of misconception around emotional well-being and emotional regulation in children. And sleep is a very biological process, as we talked about. Uh, sleep is impacted by development and environment, but sleep is also a very much emotional process. And that is why right now in this current situation that we are in, a lot of people are finding that our sleep is so dysregulated because our emotions are dysregulated and our mental well being is a little off and our central nervous system is dysregulated. So, I would be not doing my job tonight if we didn't talk about the emotional aspect of sleep and the connection that our children, our toddlers, our preschoolers, and our school age children really do need. And um, again, this is one of the areas that. You may not anticipate talking about it tonight. Uh, you may not initially see the connection with sleep, but I promise you there's a very, very strong connection here um, with what I'm about to say and with our children's ability to sleep. Uh, we did just have another Impact Award webinar um, on Monday that was called Pandemic Parenting for grades K through five. Um, and if you fall in that cohort, I would definitely recommend you check out that webinar. Um, Julie, who did that webinar, talks about um, many things that I'm only going to be able to hit the surface on tonight. Um, but when I work with families with kids ages two to 10, um, I talk to them. Uh, Teresa, your microphone cut out. Oh, hello? About three things. Oh. I talk to them about what I call the five C's, the three R's, and then, uh, so the five C's, can you hear me, Aubrey? I can. It did um, that, like your mouth was moving, but there was no sound. <laughs> and then it caught up. Um, so it looks to be caught up now. Can you say something? <laughs> there's yeah, a delay again. Yeah, there is a delay again. Um, let's see. Is everybody in your house off of uh, 
like streaming services and Wi-Fi? Yeah, I kicked them all. I kicked them all off. Um, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. It says I have full internet, so I, I'm not okay. really sure. All right. Um, but can, you, um, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. What, what was the last thing that you heard me say? Um, the three R's. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the five C's, the three R's, and then what I have nicknamed the Ion Team. Uh, so um, for young children, they are designed to seek control. And again, as parents, as adults in their world, we often don't like that <laughs> and we want to be in control. Uh, but it is 100% developmentally appropriate that our children should be seeking some control. And right now in this COVID-19 situation, um, a lot of control has been taken away from our children, us as adults, and it is just causing a set sense of uneasiness. So when you're thinking about interacting with your children and with their sleep and their routine, I encourage you to think about where can you give them some of their control? Where can you give them some choice in the routine or with how they get ready for bed? Um, consistency is important. So although we can give our, our children some choices so they regain that empowerment and that control, um, children do really strive off of clear boundaries. So it's a balance between I'm going to offer you these choices, I'm going to be consistent in what I'm offering you, um, but ultimately you, my kid, um, do have some say in this as well. So a lot of collaboration. Um, but you'll notice that the fifth C I have here is compassion. Because our young children, our school-age children, their brains are so impulsive. And their ability to regulate emotion is not really there quite yet, nor should it be. Um, and we, as the adults in their life, should have a lot of compassion for these kids. Um, again, not always easy, but really important to show some compassion. So that leads us into the three R's, uh, which the three R's um, are not mine. I did not make this up. Uh, Bruce Perry, who is an expert in the field of trauma, um, talks a lot about the three R's. And this is really based on understanding the development of the human brain. And on the next slide, we'll dive a little bit more into the, into the brain. Um, but the three R's are regulate, relate, and reason. Um, so often as the adults, in the situation. If our kids are having a big emotion, they don't want to get ready for bed, they won't go to sleep. Um, we so often want to jump to the reasoning. Okay? We want to tell them what to do. We want to give them consequences. We want to change their behavior. But if they're in a moment of being impulsive and not being able to regulate, that ability to reason is completely out the window. So the first thing that we need to do is help them learn how to regulate, which we will talk more about. Once we're more regulated and calm, then we really want to focus on relating, connecting, helping our children feel safe and secure, which again, right now in this current world situation, so many kids are not feeling safe and secure. And if you don't feel safe and secure, if you don't have that emotional need met, it is much harder to let go and fall asleep because that's what sleep is, it's a process of letting go. Um, and then once we help our children feel safe and secure and regulate it, then we can move on to the reasoning. Um, but I promise you, unfortunately, if you try to start with the reasoning, uh, you won't be successful. And everybody else is just going to get more and more worked up. Um, there's an image on the slide in front of you of the left brain and the right brain. And our young children and our school age children are very, very much right brain creatures. Uh, so all the things that you see listed in front of you, visualizations and songs and rhythms, nonverbal feelings, um, you know, they're imaginative, they're creative, they're impulsive. This is how they are designed. And it's a lot of wonderful things about this that we should embrace if we can. Um, a book I would recommend if you have uh, children is The Whole Brain Child, uh, one of my favorite books that really dives into a lot of this even more. Um, but the third thing we want to think about is, again, what I've nicknamed the ION team. So the IONS are intention, motivation, and attention. So if you are watching this or, um, you know, attending tonight or watching this recording, you have the intention, I'm assuming, for you or somebody in your family to sleep better. That intention is there. Um, and what I would want you to think about is, you know, what is your motivation? Um, you know, why are you wanting a sleep situation to change? 
And then also ask yourself the hard question of, is your motivation really set in developmentally appropriate expectations? Um, are you asking your kiddo to do something that they are designed to do? Um, or unfortunately, are you just in the situation that a lot of us are where we as parents just need something a little bit different than our kids can do? Um, but then the third one here, the attention, is something I want you to think about more as well. Because even if you have the intention and the motivation, are you in a place right now in your life where you can invest the attention needed with the sleep situation? Um, and that is a no judgment question. Um, it's really driven because I would want you to be successful in anything that you decide to try. Um, and sometimes it just might not be the right time to try some new things, and that is okay. Uh, so this next slide um, is from Integrated Learning Strategy. Uh, create this graphic, so I don't want to take credit where it is not mine. Um, but I did include it because another way to think about the brain of our children is uh, lower brain and upper brain. And our children are very much uh, lower brain. And actually, all of us as adults have lower brain needs. And if our lower brain needs are not met, we are never going to get to the upper brain. And this goes back to the um, regulate, relate, and reason concept as well. We can't get to the upper brain, the frontal lobe, um, the reasoning, if that lower brain, um, the need to feel safe, um, is not met. And if you look at the image in front of you where it says temporal, uh, temporal lobe in red, um, you'll see things like behavior, emotions, memory, processing, fear, fight or flight. And my guess is that right now, there are many young children and school age children who are very much stuck in that red part, that temporal lobe, the lower brain. Um, I know that, you know, my, my own family members, clients that I've worked with, I've definitely, you know, read about it and heard about it a lot from others as well. But many school age kids right now are having a really hard time falling asleep. And just to help you set a realistic biological expectation, um, we do want to help our children and us as adults be able to fall asleep within 20 minutes. So if somebody can fall asleep within 20 minutes, that is not a sleep problem. But if it does take longer than 20 minutes to fall asleep, that's when you want to do some of the different things we've been talking about tonight so far. Um, many school-aged children are currently having a hard time staying asleep or if they wake up, they can't go back to sleep. And what is driving this? Again, a lot of it is very much emotion-based. There's a lot of fears, there's anxiety. Um, a lot of young kids don't wanna be alone. They're seeking more connection from their parents. Um, nightmares and night terrors are cropping up in kids who didn't previously had them. Um, young children who have you know, been toilet trained for years are regressing and having some bedwetting or nighttime accidents. And um, none of this is a child being bad, and none of this is a behavior we necessarily have to change from a behavioral perspective. Um, all behavior, um, all sleep problems in young children are usually communications on that emotional level. Um, and once again, none of this is said with any judgment, but tons of compassion, because it's really hard being a parent right now. And many of you, if you have young kids, you might be feeling like, I'm home 24-7 with them. How much more connection and attention could they possibly need? Um, but if you really think about your day, and um, on the webinar that we had on Monday, the, the pandemic parenting webinar, Julie talked about this as well. Um, connection, true connection is like one-on-one. -on -one. I'm looking at you. I'm not trying to answer an email and cook dinner and half-heartedly listen to my kid, but I'm really, truly connected. And our kids really need that right now. Um, I would encourage you, if you are experiencing any of these situations, to really think about your bedtime routine. And there's so many ways to have a bedtime routine, but you want to figure out, first and foremost, um, is it working for your family? And if it's working for your family, then you don't need to change a thing. But if there's parts of your routine that is causing your child or you more stress, then you might want to do some thinking about how can we change that up. Um, if you think back to the visual of the left brain and right brain that I shared with you, um, on the right brain, you know, some of the words there were that our kids are visual learners. So if you're trying to help them transition and adjust to something that they don't want to do, using visual routine charts 
and social stories where you show it in pictures um, can be very helpful. Even if they don't want to transition, it helps guide them through the transition. Um, you want to think again about that sensory aspect I touched upon earlier. Um, a lot of kids need sensory release before bed. Um, so bedtime routines don't necessarily have to be very quiet, books and songs, lights dim. Many school age kids need to run around or do some jumping jacks or play Simon Says or have a dancing party um, and release that energy before they're ready to go to bed. Um, if you do have a school age child who is experiencing some anxiety or fears about um, the world and sleep, uh, you might want to try having them do some drawing or journaling, giving them a chance to get the ideas on paper, um, doing some meditation, guided visualizations, breathing techniques. Um, if you go to our uh, Impact Nord website, um, Aubrey and I put together a resource guide that you can look for. And in the very back are some graphics of a number of different breathing techniques that you can try for your children, but also can work really well for um, adults too. But basically the goal here is helping your body physiologically release, but also emotionally calm down and help that central nervous system be able to relax. Because if we stay in a state of worry, fear, anxiety, it counters the body's physical ability to go to sleep. Um, if your child, a uh, school age child, is experiencing a lot of bad dreams, you could try doing things like dream catchers. Um, I like to put a positive spin on the dream catcher and tell kids that it's going to catch the good dreams and give them good dreams. Uh, for some kids, if you say this is going to catch the bad dreams, it reinforces to the kid that they're going to have the bad dream. So letting them know more this dream catcher is going to catch and give you good dreams can be helpful. Um, a lot of kids like to have um, some little worry dolls or worry rocks so they can you know, paint a rock, make it their own, hold it before bed, tell their worries to it, just give them that ability to kind of transfer what's in their mind to something concrete, and then they put the rock or the worry doll down. Um, morning cues can be very helpful, um, especially if you have a kid who's waking earlier than you'd like. So let's say your, your kiddo is up at six o'clock in the morning and you yourself really need some more sleep and they're at an age that this is safe to do so. You want them to stay in their room until seven um, using some type of like okay, a wake clock or a morning sound to let them know if you wake up and you have not yet heard your sound or you have not yet seen the color on the clock change, that boundary, that expectation is I need you to stay in your room. Maybe they don't go back to sleep but they stay um, safely in their room. Um, just a side note at the bottom, um, I, I do recommend um, that, especially at this time of a lot of stress in our world, uh, to try to avoid bribes or sticker charts or punishment. All of those things focus much more on that upper brain, the reasoning um, that our kiddos just probably can't do right now. Um, so focus more on the reminders and the connection. Uh, so now moving past our school age kids and into adolescence, where things in terms of sleep change drastically. Uh, so adolescence in the world of sleep medicine actually starts at the age of 10, uh, which might be surprising to some people that I'm saying 10, um, but adolescence is actually considered the ages of 10 to 24 when we're talking about brain development and sleep changes. Uh, so in front of you, uh, you have a little comic strip. Uh, this is Jeremy from the Zitz Comet. And you can see his mom is pulling open the curtains and she's saying, Jeremy, get up. And Jeremy's saying, it's Saturday, mom. And mom says, oh, but you're wasting the best part of the morning. And Jeremy pulls down that shade, not very happy at all, and says, the best part of Saturday morning is Saturday afternoon. Now, if you have a teen, or if you remember to when you were a teen yourself, you might remember that adolescents tend to sleep in. Um, society tends to be pretty hard on our adolescents about this. Um, the narrative is often like, oh, they're lazy, oh, they stay up too late, oh, they're sleeping in all day. <clears throat> but what actually happens in adolescence is that the biological clock goes through what is called a phase delay. And adolescents, um, their circadian rhythm, their hormones shift about two hours later. And it is 100% appropriate 
uh, for an adolescent to not go to bed until 10 to midnight in that window and be designed in a way that they don't want to wake up until, um, excuse me one second, um, until later in the morning. Um, so just some research to be aware of on adolescent sleep and the adolescent brain. Um, and again, all of this is pre-COVID-19, but I can definitely see this intensifying in this experience. Um, we have been seeing for years an increasing number of teens being referred to sleep specialists and clinics. Um, we know 100% based on brain research that adolescents are not just big children and they're not adolescence is a very unique time in development. Um, when adolescents do not get enough sleep, there are two parts of their brain that are particularly impacted, the prefrontal motor cortex and the anterior cingulate. And these two areas of the brain are primarily responsible for emotional regulation, impulsivity, and decision making. So there's a lot of research out there that poor quality sleep in adolescents can lead to and be correlated with um, substance abuse, risky behavior, and mental health concerns. And what is also really important to understand is that adolescent brain development, how it happens, the sleep we get in adolescence really does set the stage for a lifetime of wellness or illness for the rest of our lives. So the snapshot in time in adolescence is so critical. Um, Another webinar that Impact Nora did was called Tweens, Teens, and Quarantine. So I would recommend if any of you have adolescents or work with them, uh, look at that on our Impact Nora website. Um, the speaker did an amazing job diving into so much more on the adolescent brain than I can do tonight. But I think it's so important during this COVID-19 and social distancing situation that we remember that the adolescent brain is really designed and they need to be with their peers. So although the situation is so hard for all of us, I think it is uniquely hard on adolescents in ways. Um, this slide in front of you just shows visually what I was referring to with the circadian rhythm and the phase delay. <clears throat> so if you look at um, the top line, the top green bar, when teens naturally want to sleep, um, again, they naturally want to go to bed between 10 and midnight, um, and they naturally want to wake up somewhere between 8 and 10. I actually think 8 a.m. is a little earlier for a lot of teens. Um, adolescents should be getting 8 to 10 hours of sleep at night, um, but consistently across the country, definitely in Massachusetts, definitely in Norwood, um, we have found that only 15% of teens reported sleeping eight and a half hours on a school night. So we know the vast majority of adolescents are not getting enough sleep, uh, unfortunately, because of school hours and when we are asking them to wake up in the morning. Because even though we are asking them to wake up in the morning early, their bodies are not designed to go to bed earlier. So they're actually getting short-changed sleep uh, in a duration perspective, but they're also getting short-changed the deepest restorative sleep because for teens, the deepest restorative sleep happens that last part of night. That is actually one of the small silver linings, I think, to this current situation of schools being physically closed, um, because I think that most adolescents are now probably sleeping closer to their natural biological rhythms because they're not having to wake up and go to school. Um, but I would encourage you, if you're a parent of a teen, um, do monitor their bedtime and do monitor their screen time um, and monitor it in a collaborative way because teens need that collaboration with their parents. Um, because even though it's okay if they're going to bed between 10 and 12, um, if our teens are feeling socially isolated, they're seeking that connection via screen time, that screen time is keeping them awake longer and longer each night um, and they start to go to bed even later. Um, I do know of and have worked with a number of adolescents who are really not going to sleep until three, four, five in the morning. And then even though they don't need to physically wake up and go to school, um, they are having to wake up and do other uh, responsibilities during the day um, and not getting the sleep that they need. And sleep is very much connected to the mental well-being of our adolescents. Um, many research studies show that anxiety and depression 
are heavily correlated with the sleep that an adolescent gets. Um, this is also very true for adult sleep. So when adults don't sleep well, we see an increase in mood disorders. Um, in the next few slides, we're going to go through the connection of sleep, fitness, nutrition, and stress, and what we can do in those areas to help us sleep better. Uh, but again, just keep in mind that there are four different chronotypes of sleepers. Um, and although the National Sleep Foundation recommends we get seven to nine hours of sleep as an adult, um, not every single adult sleeps on the same schedule. So there is some, some variation here. Um, stress is definitely a huge negative impact on sleep. And, you know, there's acute, acute stress, uh, the death of a loved one, a personal challenge, a loss of a job. Um, there's chronic stress that is kind of ongoing all of the time. I think right now in today's world, most of us are probably experiencing both the acute and the chronic stress simultaneously. So our bodies are just under attack right now with stress. Um, this current situation of how suddenly it came on, how unexpectedly it happened, and the uncertainty of the timeline. So, you know, here in Massachusetts, we're um, at a stay-at-home order uh, right now until May 18th, but that could very well change. And we don't know. We don't know if that will change or not. If it does change, don't know what it will be. And I know many other states have unfolded in the same way. And all of this, unfortunately, is characteristics of trauma. So all of us are living through what could, depending on our own stress management, our own resiliency, our own past experiences, could be a trauma triggering experience. And that's true for children, teens, and adults. And unfortunately, stress is the number one reason for insomnia. And a lot of adults are having a really hard time right now um, falling asleep. Now, on the other hand, for some people, when you get overly stressed or depressed, um, your body's response is to sleep too much. So again, think of that U curve we talked about. If you're getting less than six hours of sleep consistently or more than 10, um, I would encourage you to talk more to a healthcare provider and start to figure out what might be going on. Um, stress causes our blood pressure to rise and the increasing blood pressure is one of the biggest reasons why we cannot fall asleep. Uh, so these next couple of slides are all from pre-COVID-19, but I think they're important to understand that even before this experience, there were a lot of studies that showed just how stressed out adults were and how many adults were feeling stressed out because of workload. Um, so this one study from the American Institute of Stress showed that 46% of adults are stressed out um, by their work, 20% um, with juggling work and personal lives. I would bet that in this current situation, you know, workload, juggling work and, and personal lives and or lack of a job security, all of that has increased. And I'm sure there's surveys and studies being done that we eventually can compare what I am sharing with you tonight to the current situation. Um, but I would surmise it's only getting harder for a lot of adults right now. Um, again, surveys and the work from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation through the Harvard School of Public Health again, consistently shows that health problems of family members, work responsibility, and financial problems are the leading causes of stress in the adult population. We talked a lot, you know, earlier about, you know, women um, during pregnancy and uh, postpartum, um, but there are 27.6 million women of childbearing age in the United States. Um, that's a huge population if you work with that population to think a little bit more about you know what are their sleep and stress and support needs so you know working from home working remotely for most of us right now um, is really hard and you are probably finding that you are on the screen quite a lot uh, you know, navigating lovely technology just as we're doing tonight. And lots of studies have recently come out on what they're calling Zoom fatigue. Uh, you know, having to be looking at the screen, you know, seeing yourself, <laughs> seeing other people, having this weird mind body, you know, disconnect of your body's in one place, but your mind needs to be in another. Um, and just not feeling like, you know, we're having the structure and the dynamic that we usually do. Uh, so try to stay hydrated throughout the day. You know, water is a really important element to stress management, feeling well, and our sleep. 
Um, try not to skip breakfast. Try to eat regular small meals. Think about where you can get some exercise in your day. Um, your work area should be well lit, but not if you're working close to that time. So try to have work and screen time off, you know, a good two hours um, before you're trying to, to go to bed. Um, we're, we're wrapping up very soon, so hang in there with me, everybody. Um, but I did want to share a little bit more with you about sleep, fitness, and nutrition, um, because the three of them are very much connected. Um, if we don't sleep well, um, we tend to not make the best choices nutritionally, and we also tend to not be as active, and there are very strong hormonal reasons for why there is this connection. Um, there was a study done at Appalachian State University that looked at um, the release of cortisol and when people worked out. And cortisol is um, an anti-sleep hormone. So it has a role in many things that can be positive, but it is not a positive hormone to have if you're trying to fall asleep. And what the study found is that for most people, um, if they exercise in the morning, they had longer and deeper sleep than people who worked out in the afternoon or in the evening. And for most people, um, if you were working out in the evening, that is when you are probably experiencing the most detriments to your sleep. Because again, when you work out, you're raising your body temperature, you're raising your blood pressure, and it really can take five to six hours for those things to come down to a level um, that supports sleep. Uh, so although exercise and movement is really, really important, um, you might want to think about, you know, where are you getting it in the day in relationship to when you're trying to sleep. Um, again, talking a little bit more about that cortisol. Um, when we don't sleep well, we do tend um, to have a harder time managing a lot of physical systems in our body. Um, when we don't sleep well and we increase our cortisol, again, cortisol makes it harder for our bodies to not only get into a rested and sleep state, but it leads to higher blood sugar, lower insulin, and increased levels of inflammation. And none of those things are going to make you feel very well. And if you're hurting and you're swollen and you're inflamed, you're probably not going to be as active and moving as much as you would like. Um, so there does tend to be this really strong cor correlation between what I eat and how I sleep and then how I physically feel. Um, when we're sleep deprived, one of the hormonal changes in the brain, and this I actually find pretty fascinating, um, there's a hormone called leptin. And when we don't get enough sleep, leptin is decreased in our brain. Our brain produces less of it. And not enough leptin means we're not regulating our appetite. And when we don't regulate our appetite, we don't get enough sleep, studies have shown that your brain starts to actually crave more sugars and more salt. Um, so a lot of people who are night owls will share with me that they tend to kind of stressy, emotionally eat late at night, and they're craving and they don't know why the sugars and the salt. It's all very much connected hormonally in the brain. Uh, so just real quickly, some things that you do want to eat that can promote healthy sleep and also stress management. Um, we do want to increase serotonin before bed. Serotonin helps us both fall and stay asleep. Um, so serotonin is uh, found in turkey, chicken, milk, eggs, nuts, bananas, cheese. Got a wide variety of food that we could eat in the evening. Um, mixing the serotonin foods uh, with carbohydrates can also help that combination get you into a rested state and get all the benefits to the brain a little bit quicker. Calcium and magnesium are helpful for improving sleep. Uh, so calcium can be found in dairy and almonds and your leafy greens. Um, magnesium can be found in seeds and nuts and green vegetables. And you know, hopefully you're already eating these foods on a daily basis. Um, another really um, is something that is going to provide a healthy level of fat. Um, avocado is actually one of the healthiest foods for children with their brain development, um, but also for adults and teens as well, having avocado or other healthy fats like uh, oily fish, like salmon and tuna. Um, not only are they supporting a healthy brain, they can help us sleep better at night. Um, you do wanna try to avoid in the second part of the day, anything that contains caffeine, 
or anything that has a high sugar content. Um, obviously, caffeine is going to keep it going, has that adrenaline component to it. Um, and anything that has a lot of high sugar, your body is going to take in that sugar. Um, it causes the body to release adrenaline. And again, that is going to work against your ability to fall asleep. Okay, a lot of information, almost done. Just gonna quickly recap and help you process how to potentially move forward um, if you are struggling with your sleep. Uh, so first, no matter your age, no matter whose sleep you wanna improve, if it's your own, your teens or your child's, um, you know, just think about that ion team. What is your intention? What is your motivation? Um, if you feel that you do have realistic expectations and really just think, do I have the ability to pay attention to this right now with everything going on in my world? Because the last thing I want to do is have you stressed out um, about trying to sleep better. If it's, you know, some of these tips that I shared with you today just don't fit into your life right now. Um, you want to focus on the foundations. So look at your schedule, you know, that consistency piece we talked about. Take a look at your environment. Is it cool, dark, and quiet? Again, environmental changes can make a huge difference. Um, think about your nutrition. What are or aren't you eating and how might that impact your ability to sleep? Think about your movement for your kids. Think about their types of play. And I can't emphasize enough how much focusing on biology, environment, nutrition, and movement can change your sleep. And again, it's not going to be right away. Um, it might be, you know, five, seven, ten days. Um, but if you can think about these other areas of health, they can really help us sleep and feel better. Uh, for all of us, you know, think about that lower brain. How are you dealing with stress? How are you feeling mentally? How are you emotionally regulating? How can you meet those needs? Um, you know, again, not only for sleep, but for your overall well-being. Um, and especially for those of you who have young children, um, I would consider right now, if you can, letting go of any type of like behavioral approaches or, or sleep training. Um, we're all under a lot of stress right now. It might not be the best time to do that, but that doesn't mean that you can't try the other things we talked about tonight and help everybody sleep better. Um, so again, I really believe that sleep is never just about sleep. There are so many things under that iceberg that we need to pay attention to and consider that in the long run will hopefully support better sleep for us all. Um, obviously happy to take any questions now that came in or, or that you wanna ask, um, but if anything comes up later or if anybody is watching this recording, um, my email address, my website, also my Facebook page for my, for my uh, practice are ways that you can contact me. Uh, and last thing I'll say, um, the two pictures in front of you, one is my family now, and the other one is my two kids a number of years ago, actually almost nine years ago after my son was born uh, and my daughter was four and a half and my son was crying. He was just born an hour before this picture actually and crying like newborns do. And my daughter wanted to hold her new brother, but I was a little nervous about a four and a half year old holding a one hour old baby. So uh, we put my son down on the bed and my daughter came over and uh, hugged him. And um, as soon as he had that touch with his sister, and if you look closely, you can see his little hand is like holding onto her pajamas. Um, he stopped crying and he fell asleep and she closed her eyes and she smiled. And I think Dennis had my camera and captured this moment. Um, but I share this picture because I look at it and I feel happy and I don't feel stressed and I love my children so much. and. Um, case, <laughs> especially these days, there's a lot of stress in our lives. Um, but the work that I do, I, I do it in hopes that I can help other families have these moments too, where people are sleeping well and feeling well and experiencing the joy in life. So that is my presentation. I'm sorry for all the press glitches throughout it. Um, but questions or comments at this time? So we actually had some questions um, from Jonathan, but he, I think he left, but we can answer them anyway in case he watches the recording. Okay. Um, he wanted to know um, about the use of a therapy light uh, to help in the environment, your sleep environment. Um, was he asking it for, do you know the context, like where I was in the presentation when he asked that by any chance? When you were talking about um, your 
like having soothing lights like a uh, red mm -hmm. and, yeah yeah so so usually if, if i'm understanding his question and um if he watches the recording he has a follow-up he can definitely email <laughs> um, but if i'm understanding his question usually something like that is used if a person is having a like hormonal and physical physical inability in um creating melatonin Okay. Um, and it's actually not pretty common. Um, some children who have um, autism or sensory processing disorders actually don't produce enough melatonin. And there are some mental health conditions with adults as well where we might need something like that. But on like a, a general recommendation, um, you can usually just control it more through like the light and dark cycles of natural light. Great, thank you. He, um, he also asked, um, like the kind of sleep aids offered by popular acts like Calm and Headspace. Yeah, um, Headspace is great. I do like Headspace a lot, um, but there's so many apps out there, many that are free. Um, there's also a lot of things on YouTube, uh, guided visualizations and stories for kids um, that I like as well. Oops, I just said great, but I was on mute. <laughs> so, um, are there any other questions from other folks that are on the call right now? I never want to hang up in case someone is typing. I wish it said like in the chat bubble that someone is typing. Right, right. So if there are no questions, um, we can wrap this up. Uh, unless there's anything additional you want to add quickly before we go sleep <laughs> no I, I would just say again you know if anybody you know listens to the recording if you have any questions um you know email me but um hopefully people will check out the webinars that are on our impact Nord website and, and the resource guide um you know i think aubrey that all the work you've been doing so far has been amazing and and it's bringing all of it together in a very nice way that i hope people um really take advantage of yeah definitely well, thank you to everybody who joined, and um, we hope to see you on a webinar soon. All right. Thank, thank you, you again, everybody. Lisa. Thank you. Bye. Good night.